This is ThinkTech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good morning. This is Craig Thomas, your host on Much More on Medicine, part of ThinkTech Hawaii's live stream series. And uh, our engineers today, as always, and it's wonderful, are Rich and Ray. And joining me today is Ralph Godo, my friend of many years. Good morning. Uh, thanks for coming. And tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, the most important thing is that I'm retired uh, after 30 years of uh, working with the city uh, with the lifeguard system. And um, right now, do whatever I want, come and talk with you, uh, do a little bit of ocean safety stuff, but um, happily retired. Happily retired. Uh, honestly, I always thought you were happily working, too, so that's a credit. <laughs> you were the, uh, uh, honestly, you're an inspiration to me in a number of ways, so I might as well tell you about a couple of them. Uh, one was, I know that you generally went for a swim in the middle of your workday. And that's pretty cool. I don't know how often you pulled that off, but I know it happened. And I think that's important because part of our health is making sure our bodies are engaged. Absolutely. Um, the other way that you are an inspiration to me is that uh, you focused on how to keep people healthy, not on the drama of the intervention in ocean safety, the, I think it was called lifeguarding when you started, uh, likely. Um, it was always the rescue. And we do too much of the rescue in medicine, whether it's pre-hospital, in the emergency department, the dramatic uh, therapy. Almost always those things mean something. Well, they always mean something's gone wrong, right. and they usually mean uh, we failed in some way to anticipate a bad event and uh, didn't intervene. I think... Um you know, that whole concept of reaction uh, versus prevention is, is so true, and, and you and I have spoken about that many times. The prevention step isn't, isn't real dramatic. It's not real glitzy. It's not like, oh, they made a rescue in a 20-foot surf at Waimea. It's something that's ongoing that has to be a part of, of what we do as lifeguards and as safety people. I agree. And the, the challenge is, there are many challenges. What works in prevention, what doesn't. Uh, hypotheses are fine, anecdotes are fine, but they aren't science and they shouldn't shape, shape policy. Uh, but in addition, you touched on something else. Everybody loves drama. People pay for drama. <laughs> the, the actual saving a life or preserving health or making a more healthy place to live, that's often unexciting and it's work. But that's what you folks, walk us through sort of the evolution of uh, sure. what is now ocean safety. I think that, um, you know, when I first started, which was a number of years ago, eight, 1981, uh, you know, people said, you should go to Australia and LA County to find out what's really going on in life saving. So I went and saw some really good things. Uh, came back to Hawaii and said, look, there are things that are gonna work in LA that aren't gonna work here in Hawaii. So we, we took some of the concepts and some of the things that we learned and applied them here with that perspective. Okay. Uh, you weren't gonna stop people from surfing. You weren't gonna stop guys from going and, and laying net and diving for fish. I mean, that's part of their lifestyle. So I think that's something we accepted. Uh, we were very impressed with Australia's surf life saving. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're very dramatic. They have these studs that do all this wonderful stuff. Uh, and from LA County, we learned about organization because LA County, they're probably the highest paid public servants anywhere in the country. Really? They make a lot of money. But it's not because they're cool or they're, you know, ocean guys. They worked at it intelligently, mm -hmm. systematically. They have a pretty enlightened coastal community that they work politically and got to where they are. So they are, in my view, um, the, the example of, of what a public safety agency should strive towards. So we worked at that. And, and when we first started, Craig, well, you were around. 
It's true. <laughs> I think our, our career spans yeah. pretty much the same decades. Lifeguards, you know, they were the surfer guys, they were the ocean guys, they were the studs. Um, no one, not really any formal training, you know, um, you're going to be uh, the lifeguard at Hanama Bay. And at one point there were two lifeguards at Hanama Bay. Now there are like 12, you know. So, it's evolved from a reactionary, sit in the tower, wait for something to happen, go make your dramatic rescue, do CPR, do mouth to mouth, uh, to more of a prevention oriented organization. It's been a pleasure to watch it because uh, pretty clearly, if you're doing CPR, uh, it's not likely to end well. Um, so as an aside, one of my, uh, I like the, the TV shows on medicine that portray actual adverse outcomes, uh, failures in diagnostic uh, acumen, uh, because we're all human. Mm -hmm. um, and one beef I have with most of those shows is that uh, CPR success rate is on the order of 80%. Right. <laughs> and so the public expectation is, oh, they're doing CPR, it's going to be fine. Right. Uh, no, almost right. never is it fine. So uh, that's been a uh, pleasure to watch. I know you also innovated some uh, sort of Hawaii-specific, or should I say, innovated in Hawaii some things that worked well here and I think have been adopted largely across uh, much of the uh, ocean community. I think the two areas where um, Hawaii has really taken leadership in, in life saving. One is rescues in the big surf, because this is, you know, this is Mecca. This mm -hmm. is, you know, Waimea at 30 feet. Um, people come from around the world to challenge that environment, to surf it. Uh, so the work that the North Shore lifeguards have done and, and the West Side lifeguards have done really been pioneer work. Um, how, do you, how do you do a rescue? Uh, at Waimea when it's closed out mm -hmm. from 30 feet. <clears throat> and back in the day, you, you know, you stuck your fins in the back of your shorts, you got on the board, you took a tube, and you may make it through the shore break. Uh, you know, when you get out there, it's too gnarly to come in, so you wait for the chopper, and it's drama yes, and it's drama. trauma. Um, and it's slow. Yeah, it's very I mean, slow. Because you're saying, if you get out there. Yeah. I mean, it is really is if you get out there. So yeah. one of the, you know, the other area where we definitely did the original work was the use of personal watercraft, the jet yeah. skis. And originally they were looked at as dirt bikes on the water. They're offensive. Nobody wanted to play with them. Um, and there were a couple lifeguards that saw the potential. Brian Kailana was one of them who, uh, during a surf contest, we got wiped out, and a guy came up with a jet ski and put him on it, and he, a light went on. He goes, wow, we, you know, this is something we could use. They developed the use of the ski. Uh, they put a sled on the back, started as a boogie board, mm -hmm. and now it's evolved into an actual rescue platform. Uh, and it's just, it really has revolutionized uh, life safe, surf life safety. Yeah. And that was done here, not in Australia. Is done here. Uh, I bike down the east coast of Australia and I love the aspect of the surf life clubs to, to popularize uh, the how to do uh, water activities and the fitness and culture associated with them. I prefer your approach to keeping people <laughs> from, from getting hurt. And on a personal note, I have a friend, a uh, windsurfing friend, who uh, if there was a jet ski in the presence out at Phantom so years ago, he'd be alive today. So, um, you know, it's it's personal for me as well as just as an ER doc. Uh, familiar with the case, and you know, in a lot of those situations without without the ski, people the outcomes would have been a lot worse. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he was a guy definitely could have been gotten by a ski. There yep. wasn't one, and uh, he died, as yes. we know. In the other thing about the ski, or I think one of the important things about the ski, is it's another tool. It, mm -hmm. You know, it's another weapon in the quiver, if you will, um, which has really helped the lifeguards in their rescue response. Uh, and it takes its own training. 
Mm -hmm. You know, guys don't just hop on the ski and go. Oh, no. Um, it's pretty rigorous training, actually. The last eddy, uh, there were I don't know how many skis, right. but a huge set came through, and there were five, I believe, yeah. all going like crazy for sure on the same wave because they were caught inside. So that, these um, guys were that was really classic. good. That was, was classic. That was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that <clears throat> has really, it caught the attention of a lot of people. I, I showed that video piece at a world conference on drowning prevention mm -hmm. a couple months ago um, and you know those are the once again the drama the the glitzy stuff that people see that, that you can use to draw attention to your basic safety and health messages absolutely um, and to me it was just also a demonstration of tremendous skill yeah, absolutely uh, uh, let's talk there's uh, always a uh, hazard of getting in the ocean uh, maybe we could get uh, the leading causes of fatal injury slide uh, up. Um, I'm a water guy. If, if and when I go, it could easily be in the ocean, although I'll try to avoid going prematurely. Um, why don't you talk about sort of the relative risks of the various events in the ocean sure. and patterns you're seeing. There's been a possible blip this spring. It's small numbers in a long set so it's hard to know the you know one of the things that we've tried to do um, is look at the data you know absolutely a little science if you will uh, because th if you have the data and the information then you can make some intelligent decisions about what you're going to do uh, how you're going to deploy your resources because you only have so many jet skis and so many lifeguards so if you look at the data uh, the data really shows that in Hawaii Drowning is the fifth leading cause of unintentional injury, death. Okay. But by far the leading cause of fatal injury for visitors. Okay. And then what that tells us is, okay, are the visitors uh, more, how are they more susceptible to this? Okay. Are they less educated? Are they inexperienced? Uh, do they come to Hawaii with heart or lung conditions? Uh, all of those things have to be factored into what, what you see uh, and what you can do to prevent it. Because, we, you know, we used to think, ah, oh, the tourists, they're just, you know, they don't know what's going on. Watch this guy, he's gonna get caught in the rip. I think we've, we've shifted that perspective from, okay, we need to know what's going on. We need to educate people about risk, about putting your foot in the ocean involves some risk, you know? Um, and that's been a real challenge for us. Yeah, I, and honestly, you've done a big job. When I, when I started uh, years ago, uh, one of the places we staff is Castle, another one's Wahiwa. They both get ocean-related injuries. And I'm sure it's still happening, but the rate of shoulder dislocation, cervical spine injuries from uh, Makapu and Sandy's has plummeted. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it's because I know I've watched your folks do it. Uh, sir, I wonder if you should read again. Do you realize those kids are really good at this, but you might not yeah. be? Um, yeah. uh, I, I've seen it happen, and it makes a big impact. Uh, the next slide shows um, drownings in Hawaii by tourists versus residents and also what they were doing. I think it's pretty interesting. The, um, it's very interesting because I, I think one of the things that we kind of take for granted is that people, visitors, especially come to Hawaii, why do they come? They come for the beach. I mean, and 90% of them, I dare say, would be going into the ocean, not just once, but a couple times during their, during their stay. The data shows that the leading cause or the leading activity involved in non-resident drowning is snorkeling. So what's going on? And, that, and that's what we're trying to find out. Exactly. So in the second half, uh, as soon as we're back, we'll talk about snorkeling. This is Craig Thomas, uh, Much More on Medicine, with my guest Ralph Goto. Uh, see you in a minute. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Thank you. Kindness. Pass it on. A message 
message from the Foundation for a Better Life. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. Welcome back. This is your host, Greg Thomas, uh, on Much More on Medicine with my guest, Ralph Goto, who I've known for at least 30 years uh, in our sort of parallel careers and trying to uh, hopefully improve health and when things go sideways, uh, do what we can to fix it. Was it 30 years ago we did the, the jellyfish man uh, It thing? was more like 20, <laughs> okay. but it was more than 20. And it's actually interesting you say that because, in fact, I'll tell you what, Hold that thought for okay. a moment. I want to talk slightly more about snorkeling, but the jellyfish thing was fascinating, and I think we should talk about it yes. because it's the it demonstrates the difference between hypothesis and science. Absolutely. Um, so before the break, we were talking about how people get in trouble in the ocean, and we were talking about the fact that um, visitors seem to have a real challenge and have for many years. Uh, was snorkeling. A little later we're going to talk about a workshop to investigate sort of current states of knowledge and possible areas of research um, and see if also uh, see if the trend is changing. So this is applying science. <laughs> the, uh, years ago uh, Ralph and I collaborated uh, with uh, Susan Scott, uh, my wife, and the Ocean Watch columnist, we'll put in a plug, um, the uh, uh, on what works or not when you um, get stung by either a box jellyfish or a Portuguese man of war. And um, with the assistance of uh, a couple of your guys, particularly Landy worked his butt off on this, um, uh, we did some studies. And we, among other things, used the product that was, uh, I think, was that imported from Australia? If I, uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. There but was, it some, was product, some miracle, some miracle stuff. product that was being used <clears throat> by the gallon at the time. But there was also meat tenderizer. There was uh, salt water. There was fresh water, and this was all done in a uh, a blinded, controlled fashion. Mm -hmm. We also <laughs> looked at heat and cold, but the more important data was uh, the solutions. And to me, the really interesting there were two fascinating things about the study. The first was there were a number of people, uh, both uh, lifeguards but also uh, uh, people on the beach, entirely convinced that this was unethical because you were potentially putting a placebo on somebody. Right. And, uh, and we were. But it turned out that the placebo worked every <laughs> bit as well as everything else, including yes. the expensive commercial product. Uh, and it changed practice. The, that stuff disappeared. It's a great, it's a great story and a great example. Um, you know, it really was the first time we, as a lifeguard operation, got involved in in some science, mm -hmm. okay, some data, some research, um, and, and I think it was for us it was very enlightening how we had to do that double blind study. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the getting people's permission to do this and getting acceptance acceptance to do it, but the. I think the parallel is stuff was going on, everyone had a theory, everyone had you know, their answer or their solution, and we actually were able to test you know, those hypotheses and come up with some, some answers, which is you know, really what we're trying to do in a lot of areas. Exactly, and it ended up <laughs> changing practice. Um, and by the way, uh, Ralph, our papers were recently cited in the Annals of Emergency Medicine uh, as part of their uh, uh, addition on treatment of environmental injuries right. and it's still current so right. it's that's great we actually uh, I'm, I'm pleased <laughs> the studies don't always stand the right. test of time Good. so uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, what do we think is happening to these tourists uh, if anything and it's local people too incidentally before we actually focus on tourists I'd like to talk very briefly about free divers yep. I like free diving yes I am fortunately 
a chicken free diver. <laughs> okay. um, and as I've learned more, I've become more and more chicken because, uh, first of all, almost all the good stuff's not all that deep anyway. Yep. But second of all, well, talk about it. Shallow water blackout and those things. The, um, you know, the, the focus and the, the attention that we've put on uh, the snorkeling incidents, if you will, uh, results in a lot of, once again, theories. Everyone has their point of view. Some say it's shallow water blackout. Some say it's O2 deep, uh, deprivation. Some say it's pre-existing medical conditions. Uh, there are a lot of theories that people are holding and subscribing to. The, the free diving issue is a little different, I think, because most of the, the fatalities that we're seeing happen on the surface. You know, they're not, they're not going down and getting stuck in a hole. No, no. Or they're not chasing a big ulua, um, <clears throat> which is what happens with the local guys. And, right. and believe me, local people get in trouble too. Yes. You know, by overextending their abilities or trying to stay down a little too long. Yeah. But the majority of the ones that we've been seeing, especially in the past couple of months, are primarily not beginners, but not super experienced people. Right. Uh, they're on in the, the ocean, they're on the surface. Uh, and that's what we're trying to figure out. What's going on with these yeah. people? What's happening? We used to think, we, life course, well, look at this guy. You know, he's at Hanama and he wasn't paying attention at the video. Mm -hmm. And he gets a mouthful of water and he panics and he drowns. Yeah. Well, there's something a little more than that, I think. And, and that's what we're trying to figure out, was what happens right before that sequence of events. Do you think there's been a change, and I'm not talking about this spring blip, uh, and uh, maybe we should get uh, Dan Galanis, who I know is going to mm -hmm. be presenting at your workshop that's coming up, uh, to look at this. But do you think there's been a change in incidence of snorkeling death? Uh, it's a little tricky because the number of snorkelers, uh, tourist snorkelers, has dramatically increased over the years. You know, there's a couple, there's a couple ideas that we could put out there. Um, if you read the paper, which I know you do, Craig. Actually, um, I do. It's my job. It's assigned <laughs> at home. You know, it's 9.5 million visitor arrivals. Which looking is astonishing. Looking at 10, okay? Yeah. Uh, which HTA says, that's great. You know, they're filling the rooms. Well, what are they doing when they get here? They're going to the beach. Most of them Absolutely. are going to the beach. Okay? Uh, and it, it's an access issue as well, I think. For instance, did you go to the Great Barrier Reef? Uh, did you dive there? Okay. I've done both. Okay. <laughs> when you go to the Great Barrier Reef, I think you have to go on a boat or, you know, you can't just kick your way out there, right? If you yes. come to Hawaii, well, I don't know. It's 25, 30 miles. Are yeah. you good at kicking? <laughs> right. So you <laughs> have to. The short you part. know, the bottom line is you're supervised, okay, of yes. some sort. You know, maybe it's a boat captain drops you off, blah blah blah. But you you fly into Honolulu. You go check into your hotel room. You go to the ABC store, or you know, if you've done your homework, you go to Costco, uh, and you can get snorkeling stuff. You get it. You walk right out of your hotel room. You can go to. You can go snorkeling. Absolutely. You know. So there, there's many more people doing it, and many more unsupervised people doing it. And, and there's some challenging environments. Yeah. Most of the places people snorkel in the Great Barrier Reef, which is an astonishing thing. But most of the places you actually snorkel or dive right. are places that are sort of pre-vetted. Yes. I mean, and yes. that makes a big difference. And too. and you know what we and we did we 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 polled my colleagues. Miami Beach, what's happening, Florida Keys, what's happening in the Bahamas. Uh, I talked to my friend on the Gold Coast about uh, the Great Barrier Reef. And, you know, there are clusters of these things going on yes. around the world. But this is ground zero. We're, we're here. I mean, this is what's happening. It's snorkeling uh, by far uh, is happening here. And I think that it gives us an opportunity to really look at it and try to figure out what's going on. Well, I'm really pleased you're doing this because my suspicion, my hypothesis, <laughs> I, I, so a hypothesis is when you have a theory and you, and this happens to all of us in life, uh, you have a theory. You then need to decide how to test it. And you need to test it in a way that's uh, controlled for as many variables as mm -hmm. possible. Mm -hmm. Ideally blinded, uh, yep. although that's not always easy to do. Uh, because uh, if you don't do that, 
that's all it is, is a hypothesis. And medicine is full of many more wrong hypotheses, proven wrong by it, just like the, the jellyfish trial, mm -hmm. than right ones. And uh, I know that's your focus. <laughs> and, and the other thing to be careful about is the, the sort of what we call surrogate marker problem. So yeah. there's the, the blind adoption of a hypothesis. You yep. don't want to do that. Yep. And then there's surrogate markers, which might be some characteristic of a piece of equipment or some measurement of uh, carbon dioxide, let's yep. say. Um, I'm not saying those things aren't important, but they aren't actually proof of the yeah. answer. You know, one of the things that we've, we've discussed is we need to find out more information about what's going on with the patients or the victims of, you know, uh, fatal drownings or fatal yes. drownings. Okay. You can't interview them with all due respect because you can't interview them. But I, you can I, interview. I'm reminded of why I've enjoyed <laughs> you over the years. But you can interview the survivors. You can interview the guys that we save, that we rescue, and yes. say, hey, what happened? What would happen? Uh, look at their equipment. That's one, mm -hmm. one part of it. Interview them to find out what activities they were doing before they got in the water their general health state status uh, and things that may have contributed to it. Because yes. like you say, it's theory. And, and until we can really get more data, uh, reliable data, if you will, uh, you know, we're, we're shooting <laughs> into the wind. Yeah. Ultimately, we'd like to, to be able to actually put some prevention messages out there that mean stuff. You know, not like, just be careful. Yeah, you know, yeah. So that's not useful. Right. I mean, uh. you know, the, we, we need to tell people, hey, this is what we think is going on, and this is what you should be aware of. Yes, and if we hadn't developed hypotheses and then tested them, we'd still be doing bloodletting or leeches, <laughs> right. or uh, I, I could go on. Right. Um, we're about to wrap up, but uh, I think it would be great if you could give a little description of this upcoming workshop and invite people to come. Great. Next Wednesday, the uh, 28th of March, we're having a workshop, we're calling it the Snorkel Safety Workshop um, at the Hilton Hawaiian Village, and it's open to the public. Uh, there is a site fee to pay for lunch. Uh, in the afternoon, well, in the morning, we have a, a series of prevent, uh, presenters, excellent presenters, uh, physicians that are in the field, uh, emergency room physician, uh, the medical exam the city and county medical examiner to talk about what he's found. Dan Galanis, the epidemiologist from the state, will, will present you know, the scope and where it's going and what's happening. And in the afternoon sessions, we're going to get people in the water at the lagoon. Perfect. Put the equipment on, test it out, um, you know, and then have discussions about, okay, what's going on, what do we think, and hopefully begin to come up with some strategies and some messages. You know, that's just the way it should go. I'll look forward to seeing you there. Great. Thanks. Thank you. So this is Craig Thomas, your host on Much More Medicine with Ralph Goto. We'll look forward to seeing you next Wednesday down at the workshop.